Okay. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. I'm Carla Ellard, the curator for the Whitliff Southwestern and Mexican Photography Collection. We're here to celebrate the photography of, of Rob Kendrick and the Revealing Character exhibition, and also recognize the generosity of Frostbank for their gift of 44 photographs that are on, on exhibit. We have three speakers tonight to mark this special occasion. Um, President of Texas State University, Dr. Denise Trouth, Pam Thomas, Frost's, uh, Frostbank's Executive Vice President of Marketing, and the photographer, Rob Kendrick. Um, I'd like to recognize our founding donors, Bill and Sally Whitliff. <laughs> From Frost Bank, we have Pam Thomas. <laughs> and also from Frost Bank, the San Marcos uh, president of uh, Frost Bank, John Schott, is here. And the photographer, Rob Kendrick, his wife, Jeannie Ralston, and their sons, uh, Gus and Jeb Kendrick. <laughs> Today is uh, Rob's birthday, so this is kind of a birthday bash. <laughs> I'd also like to um, take the, a minute to thank the entire Whitliff Collection staff and our student workers. From Texas State University, Joan Heath, the Associate Vice President of the University Library is here. Dr. Van Wyatt, Vice President of Information Technology. Thank you, Carla, and welcome to all of you, and thank you for being here for this very special opening night. Um, I do want to thank Pam Thomas and Frostbank uh, for the generosity uh, of this contribution to the Whitliff Collections, and we're also glad that John Schott's here. Um, uh, Frostbank is such a great supporter of Texas State University, and we truly do appreciate that. I think all of you know that for the last 25 years, uh, the Whitliff Collections has been a, a unique repository for stories, for images of the Southwest, thanks to our founding donors, Bill and Sally. And we really are very grateful for what you've done for all of us, not just for the university, but for all of us who come together to, to enjoy these wonderful collections. Um, the artists, the writers uh, who are archived here have, have at least one characteristic. The ability to, to connect a place to the people who draw life and who draw sustenance from that place. And there's probably no better or more central um, character to this place that we call the Southwest uh, than the images that we have hanging here and that we're celebrating tonight. So thank you to Frost Bank. Um, thank you, Rob Kendrick, for capturing all of this and memorializing it. And thank you to all of you for being here. In 2004, Frostbank commissioned Rob Kendrick to take photographs of Texas Cowboys. Frostbank featured the images in a marketing campaign and then turned the project into an exhibition that traveled across Texas for more than three years. At the end of the tour, Frost donated all 32 tintypes and 12 archival light jet prints to the Whitliff Collections. We are very appreciative of this generous donation from Frostbank and are proud to be the home of this wonderful series by Rob Kendrick. I'd like to welcome Pam Thomas from Frostbank. Thank you. When we decided to do this project, uh, which really began as a small idea on the part of Brian Jesse, one of the partners of our great advertising agency partner, branding agency partner, McGarra Jesse. The other one is here, Mark McGarra, and I'd like for Mark to stand up wherever he is. Oh, he's hiding back there. Uh, this started out as an idea. And as soon as we saw the work that Rob was doing, we were familiar with Rob. He'd been doing work for us 
for a few years and done a couple of other projects. But when we saw these images of these cowboys and cowgirls that he had taken for National Geographic, we knew that there was a fit for Frost and we had to take a little time to figure it out. But as was said, we ended up with a wonderful exhibit and project that traveled throughout museums in Texas, was a part of our marketing campaign, and still lives on in most of our locations. Whenever we build a new location, this artwork is featured there, and we still have folks that are requesting the posters from the, the original um, exhibit. So we feel very fortunate to have been a part of the project. One of the things that we knew at the beginning was that we wanted to be able to share these wonderful images that reflect the character and values of the people who have helped make the history of our state, and hence our history, we knew we wanted to share them with Texans, so we had to find the right home for them when the official exhibit was over. And the Whitliff Collections clearly was the right choice. Uh, Bill immediately embraced the purpose of this campaign, and and uh, he's long embraced Rob's work, and we knew that this was the right place because we knew they would be appreciated and shared with others. So thank you for being here tonight, and please spread the word about the Whitliff Collections in this wonderful exhibit. Thank you. With, um with most of our exhibits, we usually travel them, so we plan to continue to travel this exhibit once it um, closes on July 31st. So you may see it in other venues. Uh, Rob Kendrick is a native Texan born in Spur, Texas. He studied photography at East Texas State University, and after graduating, Rob received a summer internship with National Geographic. Since then, he has worked for Texas Monthly, Life, Sports Illustrated, Time, and Smithsonian magazines. He has uh, completed 15 stories for National Geographic in the past, during the past decade. Rob has pub published three books of his tintypes, Revealing Character, Still, Cowboys at the Start of the 21st Century, and Changelings, the Tintypes of Mexican Mummies. Rob Kendrick is one of only a few photographers in the U.S. making tintypes using this historic wet plate method. Each tintype he produces is one of a kind, handmade from start to finish. Please join me in welcoming Rob Kendrick. Well, uh, thank, thank you, Carla, and thanks to everybody for showing up tonight. Um, I want to thank, you know, Pam Thomas, of course, and Frost Bank for, you know, making this revealing character project a reality. Um, and deciding on the Whitliff collection for it to be the permanent home. It keeps the entire body of work together, so every image that appears in the book will always be here, which is great to know that my kids, and if I have grandkids someday, can come back here and uh, take a look at it. So that, that's appreciated. Thank you very much. And I really appreciate uh, Bill and Sally Whitliff for their support and friendship over the years. It means a lot to have somebody that supports uh, photography and uh, of a lot of um, uh, great people. And to be included in this collection is an honor. So thank you very much. Um, I guess I'll just start out by explaining a little bit about what the tintype process is. I mean, it was a first American contribution to photography. It was patented in 1856. And it really represents, historically, images of working class people or rural people because people in a city that were wealthy would go to a proper photo studio and have a glass plate negative made and a print made. So uh, photography was more of a working class uh, photographer, uh, photography medium that was available and affordable to many people. And also photographers would travel from town to town because the images that are made are made immediately so they could be delivered immediately and that made it uh, accessible and easy for people to do it uh, from place to place and deliver them as opposed to making prints and coming back later. So any of the tintype images you see that are historic really represent people who 
are more working class people to poor people and people in rural areas. So I started collecting these when I was 19 and was just always fascinated by uh, uh, the quality and the object uh, that you hold in your hand. And so, um, you know, that's basically the history, uh, the layman's history of uh, tintypes. Uh, but I'll just start out by showing uh, images. Let's see if I can get this. Next slide, okay, hold on. All right, and I guess, uh, can we turn the lights down? Is that, is that they're down, okay, this is lights down, okay. <laughs> okay, I'll start out, I mean, this is the first um, image I ever made of a cowboy. Um, in 1981, uh, I was at home, uh, returned home from my first semester at college and uh, I was always interested in people, but I was pretty shy growing up, and so uh, my photography instructor at the time, who was a great uh, person, Jim Newberry, uh, encouraged me to use my photography as a way to get into people's lives and meet people. So uh, when I went home in December of 1981, I went out to one of the feed yards in Hereford, Texas, and where we were living, and, um, uh, and I photographed some cowboys. And when I went into this tack room, this cowboy that I photographed uh, seemed very familiar for some reason. And we started talking and found out that when I was 15 years old, uh, he was my boss at the produce department at the grocery store that I worked at. <laughs> and, and his name was Baldemore Reyna. So uh, we started talking and I came to find out that he felt confined to be working in a corporate environment uh, do, doing produce and he always wanted to be a cowboy and grew up on a small place so anyway it just uh, this is you know something that I made 30 years ago and it is not too much different than in many ways than the images that you see here it's just a different process but and so I continued with that uh, professor's instruction you know to uh, photograph people and get involved in people's lives and so I went to the J.A. ranch uh, in 1981 as well and I've photographed on that ranch for 30 years and these images I used as part of my portfolio uh, to get an internship uh, at National Geographic so the cowboy uh, subject matter has been something I've been interested in but it's also uh, treated me quite well as far as uh, opportunities that it's led me to. Let's see. Um, a couple other images in that portfolio that got the internship from college were, again, very straight on uh, pictures in black and white. These are Mennonite uh, kids. And again, using the camera to get in to meet people and be curious about their lives. And But just the very straight on approach, which uh, I was doing when I was 18 and 19 years old. So. Then I'm going to show a little bit about the process of how I've worked in tintype. Uh, when I first started, I shot cactus pads in my cactus garden out in Blanco, and I had a dark room very close by, and so it was easy to, to go and process the images I made. But then I wanted to go out and photograph people, and um, National Geographic gave me a 10-day assignment to go to Nevada and photograph on tintype Elko, Nevada. So this was my dark room, my portable dark room, which you have to have uh, in working with tintypes. And it was a four-foot wide box with a black sock that I got into. And it had no heat, no ventilation with all the fumes and chemicals I was working with. And I can't tell you, it took an hour and a half to set up. And if I wanted to move 100 yards, I had to break down for 45 minutes, move, and then reset up. And twice during that 10-day assignment, uh, you know, thunderstorms came up and we had to break down all the uh, chemistry and the equipment uh, in full rain or in one case, a full dust storm. And so after that trip, uh, you know, here, here's a snowstorm, but this, after that trip, I uh, had a trailer, I bought a cargo trailer and decided to, uh, because I was pretty committed to the whole tintype process, I bought a cargo trailer that would allow me to move easily and get in uh, from the weather, and, uh, but more importantly, be more productive because I could break down in seven minutes as opposed to 45 minutes and move, so it was very efficient. 
but it also allowed me to bring in the subjects that I was photographing as long as they could stand the smell of the ether, which is pretty uh, prevalent, uh, that I could share the whole experience of making these images, which is, you know, pouring collodion on a, uh, a metal plate sensitizing it, going out, making the image, and then immediately coming back to process the image. And the last step of the process in the developing process is to put the plate into a tank of potassium ferrocyanide, um, or potassium cyanide, I'm sorry. And I made a clear box where people could watch the uh, image turn from a negative to a positive, and it was always, you know, I always found it fascinating, and the subjects did too, so it was just a, a great environment. Um, and these images are all made, uh, I use an eight by 10 camera that's adapted to take five by seven inch plates. And so anytime, you know, people are pretty familiar these days with camera phones and 35 millimeter uh, cameras, but when you pull out an eight by 10 camera, I mean, people just respond to you differently, period. I mean, it's just a, it's a totally different experience. They engage you, they engage the camera differently. and. You know, a lot of people look at 19th century photographs and think that people were pretty unhappy because nobody smiles in the pictures, hardly. And I think the reality is that when the exposures tend to be seven, eight seconds and um, up to a minute and a half or two minutes, it's hard to hold a, a natural smile for that period or any smile for that period of time. So it's not that their lives were difficult. I mean, really, if you were in, uh, living in 1888, you were at the height of you know, uh, history at that point. Just like, you know, probably in 200 years, people will look back at us and think, oh, those poor people, they suffered a lot. They didn't have X, Y, or Z. So these people weren't probably unhappy. They just dealt with what they had. Um, I don't know if you can read this, uh, but on the, after the Revealing Character Project, I mean, every project, you know, you never really have regrets about anything that happens. Anything that happens that isn't um, uh, ideal turns into a time that you evolve into something different. And, you know, I remember coming back from the Revealing Character Project, and I had uh, interviewed people and written down the notes of their interviews, and then trying to get uh, faces and names all ID'd correctly was a little bit of a nightmare because I, did, I wasn't smart enough at the time to take a digital camera with me. And so on the next round, I took a digital camera and eraser board and, and photographed everybody with an eraser board so I had clear ID on them. But, when I went into the dark room, a lot of times these cowboys would take the eraser board and write messages, <laughs> shoot pictures doing crazy stuff, and I wouldn't find out for days later until I downloaded. So I was up in Montana, and I ran into Tom Morehouse on the left, who I've known since 1987, and John Welch on the right, who's uh, both Texas cowboys. John's at uh, Spade Ranch. and. I ran into them in Montana. They were picking up their uh, calves that they had summered up there. And um, anyway, they wrote this funny message. And John on the right, uh, when I was on the Revealing Character Project, John, uh, I ran into him at one of these ranch rodeos. And they had a chuck wagon area set up. And uh, uh, John was sitting there with the spade chuck wagon. And I said, uh, you got any real cowboys around here? Because he was all decked out and just did not look real. And he said, what, I'm not real enough for you? And, and then I saw him two years later, and he was still pissed off about it, but in a good way, <laughs> you know. So he still loved me. But. We can't see the sign. Oh, uh, the sign, I'm sorry, it says, we love you, Rob. <laughs> And I actually ran into Tom in January at the airport in Austin. Actually, he was going out to Kentucky to see some horses, but he was on a cell phone. And I'm going to play an audio clip of Tom here in a minute. And Tom's voice is very unique. And so I see this guy at a table with a cowboy hat on, which in Austin's not a rare sight. But I heard this voice, and it was early in the morning at 7 a.m. And I just walked up, and I kicked the bottom of the chair. And I said, Tom Morehouse, what are you doing? And he just looked up, but you know, it's, he's, he's a funny guy. Uh, so this, these next two pictures are from the Elko, Nevada project I did for National Geographic uh, that I shared with Brian Jesse uh, when I got back, and that 
that kind of got his, um, his thoughts going and he and Mark and, and Pam all got together. And it, like Pam said, it wasn't something that they saw it and it just happened in a week. It was something that they saw and it was a very, you know, slow process, but that's good sometimes. I mean, uh, taking it slow is, is fine. So these two images were two that uh, uh, Brian shared with uh, Pam. Okay, so the next, uh, Tom Bowerman, who's actually here tonight, stand up, Tom. He's on the cover, um, as is uh, Charles, and where's Charles at? Uh, Charles is standing, I can't recognize him without his hat on. Charles and Robert, uh, who are also uh, in the Revealing Character book. Um, so um, anyway, I'm going to do this. I'm just going to talk a little bit about, uh, or I'm not going to talk, I'm going to play audio clips, uh, again, evolving after the Revealing Character Project. At the end, not that I had regrets about the interviews that I did, but I just remember fondly so many of the stories that these uh, uh, men and women shared with me that, you know, writing it down is one thing, but hearing the voices, I mean, the way they speak is so rich that on the National Geographic Project that I did where I traveled from Mexico to Canada and drove 41,000 miles documenting cowboys in tintype, I decided to use audio just because it was uh, probably a richer experience in the end. So, um, Lee, if you can hit the audio. Okay. Hold on a second. Uh, Roy Sampson. My name was born in eastern South Dakota, born raised on a farm, went to work at early age, uh, Missouri River breaks from there on just cowboy my whole life. Several states, South Dakota, one, Montana, Idaho, Nevada. Went back here in Montana and, and just uh, a way of life that come easy. Nature and animals. Uh, raised a family. Um, probably didn't do too good a job on that. <laughs> a lot of good people. And, uh, very good wife. Probably ruined her with all this business. <laughs> she stood it well. something to pay every day and this works it works for me just a lifestyle you know it's quiet you, know, you don't get too excited and I don't, you know, I don't have to see a lot of people you know, I'm out, out away from everything I just want to aggravate you know some cows and you know, <coughs> keep kick a dog every now and then you know, <laughs> you're not happy you're wasting time every now and then you know a fellow wants to Rope something just to hear it beller, you know. And you don't get, you can't do that in town. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if they have any certain, you know, Brady Stone Day or whatever, you know, I mean, they're all kind of run together. 
This last one's but this last one's Tom Morehouse, who was in the Revealing Character book and the uh, digital image before, but, you know, Texas Cowboy. Um, first guy was um, at the end of his, you know, kind of cowboying days, kind of very reflective uh, in his early 70s. The second guy was single, young, and, you know, just a wild, <laughs> wild spark. And then Tom's kind of like, you know, late middle uh, career. And I think you hear that to me in the stories that these guys tell, so I'll just, uh, uh, Roy oh, sorry, there it is, hold on, uh, Roy no. <laughs> my name's Tom Morehouse, and I'm 59 years old, and I was born and raised on a ranch between Benjamin and Guthrie, Texas, that my dad owned. Morehouse Ranch, and actually that's the only place I've ever lived. When I was a kid, I worked for the 60s and stayed out there wagging, and then I went to college at Saul Ross, but other than that, I lived in the same house or the bunkhouse next to it all my life. And uh, so that's how I started cowboying. I didn't actually start, I was just, uh, in other words, before I remember that's what I was doing because that was the way I was raised. And, and this, I had three brothers and we all were raised like that. And I don't remember the first time I rode and I don't remember the first time I smelled burning hair from a branded keg. And I couldn't tell you how to ride a horse because it just seems to me that anybody could ride a horse because <clears throat> it, that's the way it was for lots of cowboys. They were just born around horses and rode before they were old enough to remember. But I do remember when I was a kid and I worked at the 60s and, it, and, and I'd just gone there and it was a cold fall morning and misting a little and uh, we came in from making big round that morning turned their horses loose and walked up the wagon and I walked inside that big tent which they call a fly and they had a wood stove going and, and you could smell that mesquite wood and the biscuits were cooking and it was warm in there and they had lanterns in there and you saw the dim light but I thought I was in heaven. <laughs> Okay, Lee, okay. Um, so anyway, on that trip, I gathered, up, I think, about 125 of these audio recordings, and I had to condense those down. But, I mean, I could have sat here and played Tom Morehouse's, which is an eight-minute interview with no editing, and it's all very interesting and funny. And, um, I mean, so it's these guys have a lot to say. I mean, it's pretty to the point, but it's all... Pretty interesting stuff, but I was lucky to evolve it, uh, you know, the project that way. Um, you know, I guess my interest uh, in this group of people is, is you know, their, you know, their lack of fear, I guess, of working hard and living a life that might be considered hard by other people, but doing it because they love doing what they're doing. And, um, you know, I think a lot of people... You know, the kid in Elko, Nevada that I photographed was valedictorian of his class in Salt Lake City and had offers, you know, four-year full-paid offers to go to school and, you know, probably end up making a lot of money. And, you know, he's 20 years old, so maybe he's not thinking straight, but he's thinking honestly, which is he wanted to uh, cowboy and, uh, and he was following his heart, not following a paycheck, and I think that's pretty rare these days. And I, you know, just celebrate these guys for and men and women for you know doing something uh, that they love and probably the common thread whether it's texas or nevada or montana or south dakota that any of these people have is love of being outside love for their families love of being on a horse and uh you know kind of you know not being cooped up i mean uh, that that means a lot to these people and and I think that's that's great. They're happy, uh, and being around happy people. If I have to be away from my family, there's probably not a group I've met yet. There may be other groups out there, but there's probably not a group I've met yet 
that I would rather uh, spend my time with if I'm away from my family than these people. So, uh, fantastic. Uh, the last few images are pretty far from uh, cowboys. Uh, when we were living in Mexico, um, there, are, there are mummy museums uh, all over Mexico. There's, I think, 47. And I went and did a, um, a small little project in the Guanajuato Mummy Museum. And it's the first time I've ever used artificial lights, which consisted of two fluorescent light bulbs. Uh, and working, it took me probably nine weeks, probably no more difficult project to get access to than this museum. It took me nine weeks of negotiations with the uh, you know, Mexican bureaucracy to get in, but they let us in for two nights from 8 p.m. to 8 a.m. with an assistant, and they moved the mummies in and out. And you know, the exposures on these plates were seven minutes uh, long, and you know, so I got to make a lot of images, but um, nobody moved, of course. Uh, <laughs> and, and so, so I ended up with plates that I could experiment with later, and, um, you know, I used a torch and heated things up and burned plates. And so it was the first time I'd really been afforded the luxury of making an image I cared about and then getting an image that was almost identical but, you know, uh, a little bit different that I could then experiment with distressing because since each plate is a one of a kind, I mean, if you get a plate that you really like, you don't want to start messing around with it unless you... Uh, have extras, so. And the last couple of images are from, and again, just trying different things every time I had the opportunity. These images were made in the state of Chihuahua um, and, you know, of Tarahumara Indians. And so I started making images where I didn't put the emulsion on the plate fully. And, you know, there's no, I mean, since I shoot with an eight by 10 camera, and make five by seven in inch images. I don't mark my ground glass. And um, you know the serendipity that happens by not knowing exactly where the frame is, you kind of have a good idea where it is. And in the uncontrolled nature of making tintypes to begin with, all these things, happy accidents happen, sometimes unhappy, but you just kind of go with the flow and just kind of let things happen as far as composition and where the lack of emulsion exists and whether it works or not. So uh, I started dealing with a little bit of that, trying that, see how it went. And then also um, I took the potassium cyanide's the last step of the process. So when you take it from the last water bath and put it into the potassium cyanide, it turns from a negative that's kind of blue in color uh, to a positive. And I, I started thinking, well, what if I took an eyedropper with potassium cyanide and only applied it where I wanted it to be a positive and let the other areas remain this bluish negative. And since the whole emulsion's wet, it's totally uncontrollable. So you can put the potassium cyanide on his face and that's gonna turn positive, but it starts to blend into the bandana. And again, it's uncontrolled, but you know, in a way it's kind of nice to be out of control. And so, um, Again, you know, just trying to push the process in different ways. And I think that's what's still exciting to me about making tintypes is historically everybody was trying to make a beautiful, perfect tintype. And so there's a lot of room to have interpretation, whether it's distressing or split toning during uh, the way I've done it with this potassium cyanide that, um, you know, people in the 19th century would never have done because it would have been a imperfect picture. So. Um, you know, to me, there's still a lot of room to experiment and create images that didn't exist historically. And this is the last image, which is a, a 20 by 24 inch camera that I had made. And I've, I've made a few 20 by 24 inch tintypes. Um, and I, Bill has asked to see <laughs> one <laughs> as proof. <laughs> and I mean, I'm working through the workflow. I mean, it's it's 1,400% larger. So, the actually the silver nitrate bath weighs 88 pounds. The potassium cyanide bath is 88 pounds. So everything scale wise is just mammoth. And I've made quite a few 20 by 24 inch tintypes, but I haven't made one I want to share yet. Uh, 
Uh, I mean, they're all fine. I've got the everything, but I just haven't made an image that I'm, you know, ready to share. So that's kind of where I'm going next, or at least experimenting with. And, you know, historically, they never made a tintype larger than 14 by 17 inches. So, um, you know, so this is, again, something that hasn't uh, been done, but that's kind of where I've, you know, gone with it next. Uh, we'll see where it leads to, but that's, that's it. Thank you. Uh, I don't know if there are any questions. I'm happy to answer any questions. Bill. Uh, when you did the mummy, right. and they would bring them out and you would do two, would you expose both plates at the same time and develop them at the same time? No, uh, the question was whether I would shoot uh, multiple plates while the mummy was out at the same time. And, you know, the exposure's already been six, eight minutes long. Um, typically the emulsion dries out, especially in dry climates. Um, you know, they say that, you know, within four minutes you need to be processing. So eight minutes was already pushing the limit. So I would make one exposure, then go process it, and then come back. And because I knew, of course, the subject wasn't going to move. So, so that was... One other question. Would you just a little bit tell people about your lens? Because I, I'm fascinated by that, that you would... The, the, okay, yeah, uh, all the, uh, the camera I use is a modern 8x10 view camera, um, but all the lenses I use are period lenses. I mean, I think the oldest is 1848, and then they go up to 1890s. Um, I mean, the ones I mainly use are in the 1870s range, 1860s, but, you know, they're all handmade lenses back in their day and have a certain look. I mean, uh, I think if you look at lens historians, they talk about Friday lenses, which are really poor quality because workers were, you know, it was all handmade. And so if you got a Tuesday or a Wednesday lens, uh, they, they're actually called these things. Uh, those were the best and highest uh, optical standards because it's in the middle of the work week. But Friday, if somebody's like 95% done with the lens and it's 20 minutes to quitting time, they, and uh, it's, I guess, fairly well documented. I'm not a historian, so I don't know if this is uh, per perception or reality. But I know that I've got, you know, Dalmeyer 3B lenses, three of them, and they all three take different pictures. I mean, so uh, I guess there, there's good argument for that so Friday lenses yeah so <laughs> stay away from the Friday lenses so any other questions yes yes right dark slide Well, I mean, I, okay, the uh, questions were whether I use uh, cut the tin out of uh, bright, out of uh, bright tin, is that what you call? Whatever. Yeah, tin, if I cut the tin. Uh, I, st I, I started out cutting the tin and japanning it, which is asphaltum and Everclear, and it turns into a black substance that you coat on the plate, and of course that's very flammable, and the second time I ever coated my own plates, I had uh, an explosion at my house, uh, you know, probably operator error, but it happened. Uh, and I got a healthy respect for Everclear at that point. Uh, never had an experience with Everclear internally, but, uh, uh, but anyway, um, so after that, I mean, I made probably about 30 or 40 of my first plates, and they were pretty primitive. And... Then I found somebody online that would actually, he actually was, uh, did the wet, wet plate process and he had a kiln and he had a, an operation set and he's offered to uh, make my plates for me. And I was like, great. I mean, I, I have no interest in making my own film. I have interest in making my own pictures, but nobody makes the plates these days. So, you, you know, a lot of this stuff is just piecing it together. So. This guy, Tim Merritt, out in California, I found Tim. And, man, I ordered like 400 plates from him because that was 
that would have taken me two months to make it nonstop. And so, uh, so he ended up making almost every plate you see on the wall. A guy, Tim Merritt, made the actual black five by seven inch plate. Um, the second question was putting the plate in to a plate holder wet. I just bought a Graflex, it's a glass plate, eight by 10 holder, not to get technical, but it was for medical photography and I busted out the glass and, it, and then took um, plexiglass and cut a five by seven, well, slightly s smaller five by seven inch hole in it and ground it down and put my plate in there. And because a glass plate's thicker than a piece of tin, you know, you can pull the slide out and drop it in without scraping the surface of the, um, of the plate. So, sorry if that's boring and technical, but <laughs> that's the answer. Yes? Are there many other photographers who work in this medium? Yeah, there, I mean, there's, I mean, it's growing in popularity all the time. Probably in 2001 when I was, you know, learning to do it, um, there was a handful of people. And I think digital photography is a great tool, but I think photographers are interested in the tactile nature of what, at least, at least older photographers, I should say, maybe some younger photographers that are real, you know, like to be punished by having to work extra hard, like the idea of getting their hands stained, smelling things and touching things and holding things. Um, but I think a lot of the digital photography has caused people to kind of, you know, try to find something that is more meaningful. I mean, uh, as opposed to something just created on a computer. And um, I would say that there's probably 50 people I know of that are regular producers of tin types, meaning that they're working weekly or monthly in it. Uh, and there's hundreds that know how to do it. But I know a lot of them that get into it, they get all fired up, and then six months later, they're just, it's too hard. They just, you know, it's too painful and too un unpredictable. Uh, causes, you know, if you've had control over every aspect of digital photography, letting go of, of all of that and figuring out why things aren't working today uh, can frustrate some people and they drop it, so. But, yes? Well, that's a tough question. I don't, I, I don't know. I've been trying to figure that out lately. She's been wanting to know for the last eight months. Uh, no, I don't know. I mean, I'm, uh, I've been messing around with the 20 by 24 some, and to tell you the truth, I'm not, uh, you know, enamored with it. It's big. I don't necessarily, I've not been anybody that likes giant prints on my wall, and, and I guess my first association with tintypes were these little, you know, two inch by three inch or one and a half inch by two inch objects you hold, and so the intimate nature of looking at something that close is lost at 20 by 24, so I've been having a real struggle with the scale of the increase and uh, finding something suitable to photograph with it. So, and you know, I've, I don't know, I've got interest in doing, I guess, incorporating tin types with, you know, iron sculpture and things like that. So I, I don't know, the last six or eight months has been, you know, uh, not as productive photographically, but I'm trying to find something new that I'm passionate about and, and as opposed to, I mean, I've been asked to go photograph chefs in tintype uh, for you know, a hotel chain, and I told them, no, I wasn't interested. Definitely could have used the money, but I didn't want to use, I, did, I would do it digitally because that's kind of where revenue uh, is easier to justify for me. But with the tintype, I want to kind of do things that I care about as opposed to just applying a process I love to just anything that, you know, somebody will pay for. So, you know. Tough question, the toughest one of the night, I'm sure. <laughs> yes. So your affinity for cowboys and your your leaning towards art. Um, if you have to choose which way your career is going and what you're gonna do next, what 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 is your choice? To do more fine art photography or to stick with the genre and, and continue to, to show the world what, what Well, I think, I think, I mean, I probably won't ever stop photographing cowboys because I like to be around them. They're, uh, I mean, just pleasant, honest people. I mean, Tom and 
Robert and Charles, they didn't have to, they came a long way tonight to support me. And, and that means a lot. And so, and I can call, I, you know, it's not like I talk to Tom every week or any, but we talk and uh, we stay in contact when it's necessary, but we don't do it just for chitter chatter. I mean, he's got things to do, I've got things to do, but uh, so I'll probably always continue to be connected in some way just because I find uh, their culture interesting and I think healthy. Uh, I mean, I just got back from a five week trip out of the US that I didn't have my phone on for five weeks. I didn't see one person text or use a smartphone to surf the web and I didn't have my phone on and then I got back and to LAX and sat down uh, to have a salad at Chili's and a family, normal looking family, not, uh, not you know, not geeky techno people or, or hip cool people, just a normal family uh, with their 15 year old daughter sat next to me and all three had iPhones, the mother playing solitaire, the dad uh, surfing the web and I assume the girl texting her thumb was going pretty fast and and I don't know, I just don't, uh, I don't associate the, with that myself. I mean, they're missing each other, you know. Uh, I mean, there's just missing an interaction. I think, you know, uh, we've been, you know, there's a, a writer uh, in, who lives in Wyoming, Gretel Ehrlich, uh, and she's got this incredible book called The Solace of Open Spaces. And, uh, you know, she moved there. She was uh, born and raised in Santa Barbara and then went to UCLA Film School moved out to um, uh, Wyoming and lives out there. And she wrote the, that in that book, she's just, I mean, it's all marked up at my house with just incredible passages. But she talks about how, you know, uh, in America we fill our, uh, we, we, t we take our lives like a pie shell and just fill it with stuff and obscure what's really in front of us. Uh, and, I mean, that's kind of paraphrased. But she also has uh, a quote in there about her friends asking her, when are you going to come back? When are you going to quit hiding out in Wyoming? And uh, she said, her response, uh, they said, don't you get bored? And she said she has the opposite problem. There's so much, uh, she can't take it all in. There's so much in front of her that she can't take it all in. And so, you know, I just, I guess I would rather spend my time around, whether it's cowboys, I mean, there's other working people, you know, farmers, miners that kind of have, a similar similar qualities. I mean, uh, and you know, so I'll always be in contact with this group. But uh, but you know, I don't know where I'll go after that. So we'll see. Maybe I'll win the lottery. <laughs> <laughs> Got to start playing though. I don't know if there's anything else, but yes. Among your teachers you've had, who do you feel has influenced you the most in your reaching this point in your life? Well, you know, it's hard to say. I mean, you know, my first photography instructor, Jim Newberry, was definitely crucial because he was somebody that saw something. You know, he, I think he thought I was mentally challenged. Uh, I, actually, he tells people he thought I was mentally challenged because I was, I would never um, settle for an answer that I didn't understand. And so it was this hard-headedness as opposed to mentally challenged. And probably a lot of people that know me probably know that's accurate. Uh, but, but I think, um, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, Jim Newberry, photographically speaking, but, you know, there's a lot of other people uh, that you learn from and you evolve that aren't photographers. I mean, it's people you photograph. You know, the generosity, I guess, of people who allow you into their lives who get nothing in return, uh, but they give you access to their lives. I mean, you learn a lot from that. So, I mean, I just think there's a lot of people that kind of evolve you into who you are. Uh, but, you know, somebody has to kickstart you, and probably Jim Newberry was the kickstart. So, but, you know, I mean, Bill's encouragement, I mean, his has seen uh, the Revealing Character book and the work, and and I remember vividly Steve Clark said, i got to take you over and meet Bill Whitliff. And so I went over and met Bill, and we started chatting. He said, well, let's get together sometime and talk about it, uh, you know, some things. Would you be interested? And I said, yeah. He said, what are you doing for lunch? 
and that was like it was 12:15. So we went across to Zetejas, and you know, there. So you know, that kind of encouragement is incredible. I mean, you know, Pam, Thomas, and uh, Brian and Mark, their encouragement. I mean, you just kind of take all these things and you grow and you get energized, and you know, so it's good. If that's it, then thank you very much.